Once you get one, you can't stop. They see their bodies as human canvases. You know, I don't buy paintings to hang on my walls at home. I collect art that I carry around with me. They adorn themselves with artwork that's kitschy, racy, and at times, radical. The little ones, like the three-year-olds and two-year-olds, they just look at me. He's the mayor of Tattooville. They say they don't do it for shock value or to rebel. So why do they cover themselves in permanent ink? We use the common term, they've got issues. It's really painful. It feels just like a very bad sunburn. Ow! Tattoos go beyond skin deep. For some, getting them can be a compulsion. My back was done three times, solid. They could stop, they just don't want to. They're hooked. I'm Bruce Potts. I'm now living in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I'm 61 years young. I have to do this on a daily basis. No, the nose doesn't have to be shaved. There's no hair on the nose. At least not yet. <laughs> After recently retiring from a 25-year career teaching high school, Bruce Potts is a free man. He's got a lot more time on his hands to do things he wasn't able to do before work as an extra in independent films. I put my energy crystals out. Learn about crystals. I want you to put your hands on the deck. Do psychic readings. You've been really deep down. You've been unsettled for I'm picking up three or four months. And spend more time with his pets. I have some cockatiels. And then I have two macaws, a green wing and a uh, military. Then I have my chihuahuas. Yeah, he's my baby. She, she's a love bug, aren't you? My menagerie. But the most extreme thing Bruce has done since retiring in 2003, to state the obvious, is cover just about every square inch of himself from the neck up in colorful tattoos. And once I did, it was like a rite of passage. It's just like, ah. Oh like it was supposed to have been done. At 61, a guy like Bruce Potts is clearly not an impulsive adolescent. He's not in the circus, though he probably could be. How could he have gotten so consumed by tattoos that he'd let it go to such an extreme? Like the tattoos themselves, his explanation is colorful. I had this done. In a past life, I maybe I was a Polynesian because this is what I was, you know, attracted to. And my designs are Marcasian, um, Fijian, Samoan, and it's just a tad of Maori, but not as much. As far as this life, Bruce got his first tattoo in 1969, the year he joined the U.S. Navy. Sailors have been associated with tattooing since Captain Cook picked up the tradition in Polynesia back in the 18th century. For Bruce, it started with his sleeves and progressed to his pecs. I had this done back in like 72, 1972 when I was in st stationed in San Diego. And then I had this done, my little kanji I had added when I was in Hong Kong, when I was in the Navy. We won't go in that story. For years, Bruce couldn't get the idea of tattooing his head out of his head. He knew he wanted to do it ever since he was a 12-year-old reading National Geographic. He just had to wait for the right time. It was an urge that continually came up, and it was constant. In fact, my mother, before she died, said to me, you're going to do your face, aren't you? And I go, probably. He said, just don't do it when I'm alive. I said, okay. Bruce's mother died in 2000. Three years later, he retired and moved to San Diego. It was there that he saw someone with tribal facial tattoos. He decided the time was right. I started first with a mopo. 
you know, the design that's now on the chin to see how am I going to react, and then we expanded it, and then I said, what, why not go for it? We're going down to the university area, University of New Mexico. Aside from all the tattoo work, Bruce also had implants inserted underneath his forehead. One might call them horns. While Bruce says he didn't do all this for the attention, he clearly doesn't mind it. It's enhanced me. It's opened doors. Look, you're here interviewing me. If I was just a lowly teacher, you know, how many of us that are out there? When it comes to body modification, the permanent alteration of the body for non-medical reasons, Dr. Armando Favazza wrote the seminal book on it, Bodies Under Siege. The professor of psychiatry at the University of Missouri, Columbia, has never met or treated Bruce Potts, but he's counseled many other heavily modified people over the course of his career. But certainly it's uh, a kind of recognition. And, and a lot of people feel underappreciated in life. And doing something outlandish is a way, sure is a hell of a good way, to get attention. But incredibly, here in Albuquerque, people sometimes hardly seem to react. Hi, how are you? Oh, pretty good. I want a double shot latte. Okay. Anything else for you today? No, that'd be fine. Then I want you to stamp my card. Okay, thank you. Yeah, let's see if there's anything around here. There's a lot of ink in this area in Albuquerque. You will, you will probably notice it the longer that you're here. Anything is, you know, just a normal guy, really. You know, he may have a lot of tattoos, but he's wearing a sweater vest. When we come back, a heart surgeon with an alter ego sum might find shocking. I, I love to just push it. My name is Yusuf O'Day. I am 36 years old, a cardiothoracic surgeon at New York University. I live in New York. Come on in. Are you ready, Masashi? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Take any idea you might have of a heart surgeon, turn it on its head, and you've got Dr. Yusuf O'Day, Joe, to his friends. Knife. Joe's into heavy metal. He travels all over the world to attend music festivals and concerts. He likes fast motorcycles, extreme sports, and taking people's lives into his hands as a fellow in cardiothoracic surgery at NYU Medical Center in New York. They go up with the table. Clearly, this heart surgeon has a taste for living on the edge. It's just who I am, and it happens to be that I love to just push it, push it reasonably. As long as I feel that I'm in control, I think that everything's going to be okay. <laughs> She's got a good, good vessel here. You can feel it with my thumb. Nowhere is Joe more in control than in the OR, where he helps mend the broken hearts of several patients a week. Okay. This is an 86-year-old gentleman that uh, is going to get a coronary artery bypass graft. And we'll also take a segment of vein and we'll, um, we'll bypass uh, the two vessels. But every once in a while, even a guy who thrives on being in control has to hand over the reins. Case in point, Joe's been obsessed with getting a tattoo since he was 14 years old. That he couldn't possibly do himself. But he wasn't going to let just anyone permanently mark up his body. After a year of intense research, he settled on one of the most renowned tattoo artists in the industry. Joe. Oh, I'm full. When you're done, I'm ready. Paul Booth of Last Rites Tattoo Theater in New York. I've looked at a lot of his, his work, and, uh, and he has a lot of the personality traits that I like and I have, so it was just a perfect match. Hey, Paul. Hey, man. How are you? Paul's tattooed his share of heavy metal rockers, 
Members of the bands Pantera, Slayer, and Slipknot come to mind. But it isn't often he gets a heart surgeon walking through the door. This was a guy he wanted on his client roster. So Joe got to cut the line, skipping a three-year waiting list. Paul and Joe have been collaborating on a tattoo ever since. Between the two of us, we um, came up with something pretty, uh, pretty, pretty nice, pretty very, very interesting at least. Let's yeah. See how this came out. Yeah. Let's see it back. All right, it's coming along. The image they've created is a demonic figure reaching into Joe's chest and ripping his heart right through his back. The heart, of course, has to be 100 percent anatomically correct. Paul reviewed Netters, which is one of the famous anatomy books, and he reviewed that for about two, three months before he did any work. It's one's bluish, right? Absolutely. One's blue and, and one's red. And okay. if we switch that around, that would be that a, screws uh, up a big everything. problem. We've got one fat blue one coming up. Okay. Needless to say, it's an image many would find incredibly graphic, even disturbing. Here. Not the kind of thing you'd expect a heart surgeon to do. But Joe says his patients and colleagues don't seem to mind. Right. It doesn't seem to bother anybody. I don't think that it should either. I think that it's based on your interaction and the connection or the chemistry between the surgeon and the patient and not what's on his or her skin. All right, man. Off and running. So far, they've been working on this tattoo for two years, and it's still not done. That's due mostly to Joe's hectic work schedule. He's constantly had to cancel appointments, and when he does show up, Do you mind? No, no, I'm good. He's often interrupted by the uh, hospital. Do that one more time, actually. Okay, good. Yeah, I would say so. So I would, uh, you could hold off on the uh, LB minute. I'd just give him some uh, W to mean 250. See how he does. Yeah, and see how he does after the 250 of uh, dobutamine. I'm sure it's going to work. That's right, 250. No, no albumin. Yep, all right. Okay. Bye. It's not just a sacrifice in terms of time. There's the money. A tattoo this size could cost thousands of dollars. But Paul hasn't charged Joe retail. He jokes that he's now got the doctor on retainer for future heart surgeries he may need down the road. And aside from the time and the money, there's the pain. It hurts like mad the first 15 minutes. And then after that, it just uh, it actually goes away. You just don't even feel it. Hey, Yusuf, can I yeah. you see your tattoo, you know, before the entire world see the tattoo? <laughs> I promise I'll show you as soon as I'm done with the case. How's that? Okay. Promise. Clearly, getting this large graphic tattoo means a lot to this young doctor. To go this far, he had to be hooked. The question is, why? If you asked my ex-girlfriend, she would say it's, uh, symbolic because your heart is being torn out of your chest because you're emotionally you know, <laughs> challenged. But if you ask me, I say it's just because I, uh, I enjoy the art, I enjoy the anatomy, and I wanted something anatomical, and, uh, but I also like the dark imagery, so I was able to incorporate both. Psychiatrist Armando Favazza has never met or treated Joe but theorizes on what might motivate a surgeon to do something like this. Ever since uh, in the uh, Garden of Eden, you know, God uh, surgically performed a maneuver on uh, Adam to produce Eve, surgeons have claimed some sort of, of uh, kinship with God. Uh, and surgeons, you want a good surgeon to be narcissistic. I want him to be captain of the ship captain of the, uh, of the uh, operating room. Rotate a little away. People may get these sort, sorts of tattoos or do things just to fulfill this sense of narcissism that I'm, I'm so great and here's visual evidence that I'm great, that I can maybe, tie, uh, that I can maybe tame the monster. 
uh, that's, uh, you know, that's on my skin. When we come back, if she hates it so much, ow, ow, then why doesn't ow. she just stop? Ow, I'm not going to lick it up. Meg. I am 28 years old. I am a heavily tattooed observant Jew and I live in Brooklyn, New York. Of all the people in the U.S. with tattoos, an estimated 40 million, why focus on Megan Barber? Because she may stand out even more than most. Today we are going to the grocery store to get stuff for matzo ball soup and then we're going to cook a nice big dinner. Meg's body is heavily modified, tattooed, pierced, stretched. She's even had scarification work done. That means getting a tattoo essentially cut into her body with a scalpel. I've got peony blossoms up here. I've got stuff up on my shoulder. It's a big hot rod piece, basically. My neck stuff goes up to here. When it's finished, it'll actually go like along my jawline. <laughs> At the same time, Meg has found religion. Not just any religion, but one in which getting a tattoo is strictly taboo. Everything closes early because of Shavos. Meg lives in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, one of the most religious Jewish enclaves in America. I live in a Chabad Lubavitch community. It's a form of Hasidic Judaism. Their main thing is, is trying to teach people about Orthodox Judaism and trying to bring people back to be more observant in order to speed the coming of the Messiah. I'm by no means an Orthodox Jew. I'm a religious person, I'm a respectful person, and that gets me a, a long way in this neighborhood. Meg is striving for acceptance in the community, and she's finding it, to a point. She covers up out of respect, but it's hard for her to hide everything. As a result, even a routine trip to the grocery store can be an adventure. Generally, nobody really says anything. Um, you know, the other day someone stopped us and asked us if we lived in the neighborhood. Just the guy, like, actually blocked off the aisle. We couldn't get through, and then he was like, all right, do you, are you guys from the neighborhood? Like, asking my boyfriend and I, we were like, yeah, and then finally he like moved aside and let us walk through. It was very strange. I got a lot of curious looks, I think would be the best way to describe it. Meg started getting tattooed when she was 18. First one, and then six months later, another. And then from there, I started getting getting other tattoos. And by then, I had gotten an apprenticeship body piercing. So I was working in a studio with tattoo artists. And you know, the, the accessibility to get tattooed was there on a greater level. So it just started happening. That's like my tribute to Cincinnati. That's the area code. I pull my bangs back. I have my forehead tattooed. And I've got little stars on both of my uh, sideburn areas. I just don't like what was there and so I'm having black work done over it and then I'm gonna have scarification done over the black work at some point. One or two tattoos? Sure, but facial tattoos, earlobe stretching, and ritual scarification. What would make someone go this far? Dr. Armando Favazza has never met or treated Meg, but says there are some common reasons people do this. For example, rebellion and anger, especially towards people in the past who may have harmed you or people who have um, um, let you down. Dr. Armando Favazza is author of Bodies Under Siege, considered to be the seminal book on self-mutilation. He's also a practicing psychiatrist. And what happens is that, you know, those, those, that anger, uh, that rebellion lays buried in your unconscious, and, uh, and you get to a point where you can say, you know, I'm gonna pay them back. I'm gonna get this tattoo. But Meg doesn't see it that way. I have tattoos because I have tattoos. 
I don't have tattoos to hide behind. I don't have tattoos to make up for some lacking part of my personality. Nothing of that nature. That's not the case. I, I'm visibly tattooed and I'm heavily tattooed in places where people see because I like to see them. By definition, if it's in the unconscious, they have no consciousness of it. And if you bring it, bring it to their, their attention, they will say, no, you're absolutely wrong. But they can never win that, that argument because I say, well, it's in your unconscious, you don't know. But I'm the expert, and therefore I say it's in your unconscious, so you can't win. Meg's dinner guests tonight include her boyfriend, Dan, and her friend, Anne, who's also tattooed and recently back from a trip to Israel. It's a safe bet the conversation at this Sabbath dinner will be unlike any other in this neighborhood tonight. Like the talk of Anne's tattoos, one might think because she's been getting more into religion, she would have stopped getting them. Not the case. I have egg beaters, like electric egg beaters, tattooed on my hips like guns, so I can move them out and mix things. Those are big. I got those a couple months ago. That in spite of the fact that tattoos have caused Anne substantial problems. All right, so these are the gifts. People who let me as a nice Jewish girl could never date me or take me home because of my tattoos. And then friends of mine who were tattooed or pierced or whatever, uh, they kind of are put off by the fact that I want to have a, a kosher home someday. So because of my tattoos, I've, I've effectively put one foot in two different worlds. And because of that, I can never join either one and I've kind of screwed myself. Do I, I sometimes wonder what it would be like if I weren't tattooed? Yes, but at the same time, I appreciate that I'm heavily tattooed because I've had to work harder to get the respect that I get in the community that I live in and in the, in the things that I do. I think Dan will like this. Meg still plans on doing more body modification, even as she delves deeper into religion. How are you? Her boyfriend, Dan, sees how much extra work it takes for them to be accepted. And while Meg is confident it will eventually happen, Dan isn't so hopeful. I don't think we'll ever be really accepted in the Hasidic community um, just because of the fact that she is so heavily modified and that kind of thing. But um, it, it, it really isn't that much of a conflict for me. The poet Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, make your own Bible. That's exactly what Meg and company are doing as they bring in the Sabbath their way. When we come back, the tattoo convention circuit and the cast of characters who keep coming back for more. My back was done three times, solid. My elbows were done five times. It's a circuit. So why do they do it? What are they thinking? Why would anyone sacrifice so much time, effort, money, and pain? You want to turn your arm the other way? They get covered in ink. They've heard all the armchair analysis before. They did it out of suppressed anger or rebellion, out of narcissism, insecurity, or the need for attention. And then there's the need to express individuality. Never has that been more apropos than in today's high-tech world. You have, I don't know how many credit card numbers. You have a cell phone number. You have a home telephone number. You have a passport number. You have a social security number. As people started to feel almost helpless, Tattooing became more popular for some people because it was uh, taking a stand and saying, look, I can't take this anymore. I'm going to put a mark on my body that is uniquely me. And nobody can change it. Nobody can take it away. With millions of American adults sporting tattoos, our interview subjects are far from alone. They can find their brethren almost any given weekend at tattoo conventions held in cities across America.
Shows like the St. Louis Old School Tattoo Expo are a virtual mecca for the heavily tattooed. It's a circus in the sense that you see the same people, you make close friends with people, you've never been to their house, but you have a very intimate relationship with them. unwritten rule that uh, we all stick together through thick and thin. I've been in recovery. I found that recovery is intertwined in tattooing. It's uh, become pretty much my life. It's an adaptation of the photo VJ Day Kiss that was in Time Magazine. Um, it's a nurse and a sailor kissing after World War II. Obviously, I have both um, both arms completely done. I have this hand that was just recently done, like four weeks ago. I have full chest piece, full neck piece, little tattoos that go on my forehead. People get these tattoos because a lot of times they're uh, feelings of, of inferiority and low self-esteem. So maybe they put a big tiger on their chest. And these are, you know, a lot of times, fairly meek individuals. It's kind of a magical thinking. They're going to get the sympathetic magic of getting a, a tiger's power if they, get, if they get tiger on them. Professional basketball players, I mean, they have the most god-awful tattoos you could possibly imagine. They're just covered with them. And, but you have tens of thousands of, of young men, and um, now even some women, mainly men, uh, young boys who, who want to become great basketball players. They're their heroes and God, by God, if, if they've got their tattoos, then I'm going to get mine and maybe that'll make me a better basketball player. And it's magical thinking. This sleeve is all the old classic Las Vegas signs. My mom thinks I'm crazy. Every time I get a new tattoo, her response is, are you done now? My dad thinks I'm just stupid, but he says it's your life, do what you want. Our next contestant up is... At tattoo conventions, people are rewarded for having artwork on their bodies that up until only a few decades ago used to be the province of sailors and convicts. Out in public, some of the more extreme cases could be considered deviant. Outrageous or in some cases, just plain silly. Now that puts a new twist on Dirty Dancing right there. <laughs> no one's more consumed by tattoos than convention MC Chris Longo. Out in public, a guy like this could easily end up marginalized. Here, the 49-year-old welder from New Jersey is a venerable elder statesman, the ultimate insider. If you're alone out there, or there are only a few of you, people think you're odd. But if you get together with a whole group of people who are just like you, it's a pretty nice feeling. We're validating each other. He's the mayor of Tattooville. Oh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> I just say that. No one can deny Chris has earned the title. My back was done three times, solid. The top of my chest was done three times, solid. Everything on my arms were done a minimum of three times. Like both of my elbows were done five times. Mr. Liberty, that was actually done seven times by seven different tattoo artists. In this world, where the body is often seen as a canvas, the lines of decorum are often blurred. I could give you a sensory shot. Take. Or have to be. So why do these people have such strong convictions about their tattoos? It's world famous, really. Why are they so consumed? They say getting inked is a way for them to express who they really are. But who they really are partly comes from being this tattooed. How would a professional psychiatrist analyze this? They're playing out something on their skin. Skin is a bulletin board, and, and they're giving a message out. I think they're, they're probably cr trying to create s a new identity or create an identity for themselves. People get tattoos for all the basic same reasons. Uh, when someone is born, 
when something dies, going into boot camp, coming out of boot camp, going to war, coming out of war, falling in love, falling out of love, uh, for hope, for despair. So tattoos are markers, and they're also markers of inspiration, markers of spirit, um, markers of our soul. When we come back, everyone starts to finish the work that may never be done. Isn't that festive? I like it. In America, tattoos are a growth industry. A Harris poll estimates that 36% of Americans between the ages of 25 and 29 have at least one, but few go as far as Bruce Potts, the retired school teacher. Bruce. Hi, Jessica. How you doing? Good to see you. Well, shall we begin? Okay. Uh -huh. While it may appear Bruce has maxed out from the neck up, incredibly, he says he's not done yet. Uh, I'm going to be having the triangles done with multicolor combination of yellow and this pinkish color that will look good against the other colors I have. Now, Bruce, I'm going to ask you when we're going to alternate these colors. Mm -hmm. um, do you want me to start with the posing colors, or do you want to do the same, like pink, yellow, pink, yellow, or do you want me to do pink, yellow, pink, yellow? Or... No, let's keep it the same. All right, Bruce, once again, you ready to go? I am ready. I'm going to start right up where it counts. <laughs> Although Bruce insists he's gotten mostly positive feedback about his look, it has to be noted that many, most, would likely view him as an oddity. In the opinion of one practicing psychiatrist, what many heavily tattooed people crave more than anything is attention. Look at me. I exist. I'm in your face. Deal with it. Bruce, for some reason, can sit like a rock when he's getting his face and head tattooed. It's something that I personally don't understand. <laughs> but power to you. Power to you. How's it going, Bruce? Oh, it's great. Ain't no thing. What are you, <laughs> what are you thinking about? I don't. I just kind of get into the moment. A little twinge of pain I told you. Nope. <laughs> you yeah, have the itch. <laughs> Jespa knows when I, I, I had enough. It's I, I wiggle a lot, I think, right in the end, don't I? Mm -hmm. We are finished. We are done. Somehow, tattoo artist and tattoo e both know when it's time to stop. Oh yeah! Now isn't that festive? <laughs> I like it. Yeah, that's neat. It may seem like there's no more work to be done here, but from the sound of it, it's clear Bruce will be back. Now I have to get this done and around here. Then I'm done. Let me see the back. <laughs> Wow, you're really close, man. I'm almost there. Yeah. In New York, heart surgeon yeah. Yusuf O'Day is just moments away from finishing his masterpiece, the anatomically perfect heart being ripped out of his body. He knows some people might be offended by this tattoo. Doesn't bother him in the least. If they are put off by a tattoo, then they were going to be put off by something else that I probably said or did a little bit later. So it just kind of weeds them out. Yeah, dude. I think we did it. I think it's where I need it to be, as long as you're happy with it. <laughs> All right. Once you start nearing the end of your tattoo and you realize that it's going to be over, people start thinking of other tattoos to get. And like I said, it's crossed my mind, but I don't see that happening. But maybe. <laughs> Two weeks later, the heavy metal surgeon, moments away from performing heart bypass surgery, shows off the goods. Needless to say, he's a bit of a rock star around here. Besides all his other uh, interests outside, he's 
an excellent cardiac surgeon. He's a wild man. <laughs> what the hell is your shop? Right there. It's the one that says tattoo. I don't like walking this far after oh I Oh my god. While Dr. Joe is fairly confident he's done after one, Meg Barber says she's still got some work to do. But only, she claims, to perfect what's already there. She may be hooked on tattoos, but she's not hooked on pain. I hate getting tattooed. I'm, I'm the biggest wiener schnitzel when it comes to getting tattooed. Like, I'm fussing and yelling and throwing a fit the whole time. No. You sure? Just... Goodness. What? The f***ing and moaning is what. <laughs> what I do. Last time I got tattooed, I actually swatted my tattoo artist. And I was like, stop, you're tattooing my soul. Quit, that hurts, enough. So why not just stop? Stop where you are. Because there are things that need to be finished. It's kind of like you have a messy house and you still got a pile of clutter in the corner. You got to clean it up or else it's not done. That's where I'm at. Some people can actually be done. And that is when they, they can get that final tattoo that somehow gives them some peace with themselves. Um, but for a lot, said, it's a never-ending process. And if, if they don't come to some self-realization or some self-peace, then they have to move on. And, and from tattooing, you go on to branding. And from branding, you go on to putting implants in your, uh, in your skull and in your skin. And then from there, it can really start to escalate into uncontrollable uh, body modification. In fact, Meg is planning to take her modification further. Today, she's having a tattoo blacked over by her best friend, Brooklyn tattoo artist, Joy Ramore. Then I'm going to have scarification done over it. And when the skin's cut, as it heals, it'll heal in a white design. So it'll almost be like a reverse of a tattoo. Oh, hell. Oh, sh What used to be easy when Meg was young and impulsive is more difficult now that she says she's old and cranky. Within an hour, she calls it quits. I'm done. She wants to be done. Oh, will you? Yeah. It just feels too gross. Okay. I don't want to throw up. Okay, okay. I'm not in the mood to puke today. Fine. It went as expected. The tattoo turned out good. It's done. Uh, When we return, what's it like living in their skin? The prejudice tattooed women say they face on a daily basis. You're a raging junkie and nine out of ten times a complete whore. the New York City shop where Megan Barber works, she and her friends say having their bodies modified has given them spiritual sustenance. Some of them have gone way beyond tattoos. Meg has several piercings. She's had her earlobes stretched to the point some might consider deformed. And she's into something else called pulling. Which is essentially where you have the hooks in your skin and you are tied to someone else that has hooks in them and you pull against one another. For me, it's a huge emotional release. Mm -hmm. It's it's one of those things like afterwards I just feel really calm and I feel centered and I can like actually zone out and really think while I'm doing it. Meg's best friend, tattoo artist Joy Ramore, has an even more extreme interest. She's into something called suspension. Piercing hooks through various parts of the body depending on what style you want to hang and uh, suspending from them, being lifted up off the ground and hanging from your flesh. It's not as bad as it sounds. <laughs> it sounds bad. It's not that bad. It sounds terrible, but it's not that it's bad. It's really not. If you do it from just one hook, one or two or three hooks, then the pressure is really intense. And this is part of the Native American, like the Sundance ritual. I mean, they only did it from two hooks in their chest. And that that's, but that was tied into a whole religious ethos, and, and, and the whole culture was involved. 
And so people are playing around with this sort of thing now, and they're mimicking things without having the, the true religion. And there's mul multiple suspensions with multiple hooks, no big deal. It looks a lot worse than it is. Nothing to be concerned about. So you might as well do yoga. Because Meg and her friend Joy are so heavily modified, people assume they're wild, which they say couldn't be further from the truth. Both have serious boyfriends, and their favorite activity is to have pajama parties where the two friends pour over, get this, crate and barrel catalogs. They're just two normal gals, they say, in search of a post office on a cold winter day. It just happens that they're pierced, stretched, tattooed, modified, and into getting pierced Wait, with hooks. We went down too far. We're yapping like a I know. Things. We gotta go this way. I don't know where we're at. We have to find the post office. Am I gonna have to check on my phone? Back at Meg's workplace, we asked Meg and a few of her friends about what it's like living as heavily tattooed women. They all seem to agree tattoos have been a handicap, at least to some degree. Men definitely think you're freakier because you have the artwork and they think that you've had a drug problem in the past. Absolutely. Yeah. You're a raging junkie and nine out of ten times a complete whore. When you get tattooed, you sign a release form that your artist is using clean instruments, not that people are going to make fun of you and look at you like you're trash your whole life. You don't know that going into it. You know, it's once you start getting into it, and then you're like, ah. And once you're already in the boat, you might as well just go ahead and pour the buckets of water into it and yeah, let it sink. If that's what it's about, letting the boat sink, then 61-year-old Bruce Potts is on the Titanic. Still, he's defiant. He says if he could do it all over again, he would, except for the implants inserted underneath his scalp. Aside from the part-time job teaching public speaking at the University of New Mexico, Bruce has nothing but time on his hands. He spends it getting to know area attractions, like the Albuquerque Aquarium, where he may or may not have adjusted his age to get a discount on admission. Hi, I'm over 65. The advantages of getting old. <laughs> Looking the way he does, Bruce commands nearly as much attention as the fish. The little ones, like the three-year-olds and two-year-olds, they just look at me. I really like the color. They're very bright, powerful colors. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tiger. Strangers approach him often to strike up conversations. You from here? Yeah, I'm from Albuquerque now. I was a teacher for 25 years. You were a teacher? Yeah, <laughs> and I taught 18 years for UNM and then for the public school system. What are you Something I wanted to do. <laughs> Something to do after retirement. <laughs> right. well, it was nice meeting you. Well, nice meeting you and All happy right. tattooing you. I'm yes, sure sir. you're going to be collecting more. Yes, sir. <laughs> we'll see you. And what about companionship? Bruce was married once before the head tattoos. It didn't work out. He says he's open to meeting someone. He just doesn't ever want to get married again. Whoever this future partner may be, she'd have to accept Bruce just the way he is, head implants and all. In the Old Testament, Leviticus 19.28, God in no uncertain terms forbids tattoos. Ye shall not make any cutting in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. Tattoos have come a long way in terms of acceptance, but if unconditional acceptance is the goal, they still have a ways to go, as ink slowly seeps its way into the cultural mainstream. The Latin word for tattoo is stigma, which was a, a, a mark of disgrace. And it's still looked upon in our culture as uh, something that is a stigma. But it's a cultural attitude, and cultural attitudes change. It will change, you know, things, things change.